Hegel and the philosophy of history In Hegel's philosophy he says something fascinating about China and India 1. China and India lie, as it were, still outside the world's history as the mere presupposition of elements whose combination must be waited for to constitute their vital progress. In Asia arose the light of spirit, and therefore the history of the world. To Hegel China lies outside of history due to the complete absence of private property and a negation of a Western class system that arose from private property. But on the other hand, it is where history began in the form of spirit. Hegel sees spirit as historical. It is based upon the spatial and temporal plane of a whole people. Spirit is achieved in the recognition of the fundamental basis of material reality. The blazing heat of the sun gives birth to a new day, rising in the east and plunges into darkness while moving towards the west. The basic principles that hold up Chinese civilization have for the most part remained the same for thousands of years, which allowed China to maintain their socialistic spirit throughout all moments of chaos under heaven. The East Asian culture of respect for elders, friends, and the respect of the emperor reproduced a way of life that was unique to China. The reproduction of their ways of life were way more important than the reproduction of commodities because engaging in endless consumption for no reason at all, strips away what was once socially applicable. Even back then, the Chinese way of life, was able to produce long-term projects and implement some sort of plan to get there for betterment of the Chinese people, foreshadowing their inevitable reversion back to a planned economy through scientific socialism. Outside of China and India Hegel provides the example of the Persian Empire's universalism too. The Persian unity is not that abstract one of the Chinese Empire. It is adapted to rule over many and various nationalities, which it unites under the mild power of universality as a beneficial sun shining over all, waking them into life and cherishing their growth. This universal principle, occupying the position of a root only, allows the several members a free growth for unrestrained expansion and ramification. In the organization of these several peoples, the various principles and forms of life have full play and continue to exist together. We find in this multitude of nations, roving nomads. Then we see in Babylonia and Syria commerce and industrial pursuits in full vigor, the wildest sensuality, the most uncontrolled turbulence. In the Hellenistic-centric retellings of history, the Persians, under Xerxes, were made the evil monsters who killed all the Spartans in the movie 300. This is far from the truth. The first leader of the Persians, Cyrus the Great was known as the liberator of Babylon from the chains of the Median Empire. After decimating his enemy, Cyrus forgave the entire former Median Empire which allowed for his former enemies to recognize their objective reality and role in history as a united Middle Eastern Empire that saw itself as the entire world. He made the first real universal state based upon the ease of trade and the gravitational pulls to a higher sense of sociality and is the genesis of socialist civilizations. Cyrus the Great's Persia was not substantiated on absolute dictatorial rule from the sovereign but rather from the respect of the people and the overall improvement of their lives that worked in a symbiotic moment of true government. I believe that it was the sole reason why a large government was able to provide people autonomy in this dialectical process. Oh, and by the way, if I see another person try to explain how Cyrus the Great was the first advocate for human rights I will go crazy. Human rights are very specific to the Enlightenment. He banned slavery on a societal wide level and not listening to what it right that is determined by the monarch was a transgression of the law. It was not the same for the Greek city-states because these were small moments in a superordinate history. If the birth of Western civilization was Greece, then it is due to the structure of private property and the ownership of an individual in the form of slaves. It was the Greeks who brought slavery to Egypt, before this construction was undertaken by free laborers. If you want to get technical you can say the Bronze Age Minoan people were socialist because of their palace economy. But, let's not forget the Bronze Age kings were deposed and replaced by oligarchs and aristocrats. Each Greek city-state had their own colonies, stretching from the western coast of Anatolia to the Iberian Peninsula. It's no secret they competed each other for the discovery of land in the Mediterranean. 
This occurred due to a population increase in the Greek city-states and many aristocratic didn't want to share their land anyone. This gave citizens from each city-state no choice but to find land outside of their borders. Another reason was this happened was simply because Greeks wanted to raid the presumed mysterious East for riches and sought out new trade, through force I guess. The Greek age of colonization was finally halted by the Achaemenid Empire, while actually allowing autonomy for the Greek people. The only Greek city-state that rejected an oligarchic class was Sparta. Lycurgus, creator of the Spartan constitution, tarnished the oligarchy by creating land reform for the masses. The only true monarchs, not particularly hereditary, are not controlled by an aristocracy, rather but the will of the people. If you are asking how these are socialist, I'll explain. Socialism is based in material reality and is not formulated in ideology. This was the case until the implementation of the modernity sickness, only then do we have to speak about an ideology of mending former social bonds that were violently ripped away from us. The Asiatic mode of production, the Mongols, and communist thinks on the amp many people get confused when you talk about feudal societies not being the economic system of the entire world during the medieval times because we think in terms of global economics. The feudalist mode of production is specific to Europe alone. I've actually been told in school that feudalism started in China. Marx makes it clear that he believes the Asiatic mode of production was different from Mediterranean antiquity and feudalism, rather it was its own substantial mode of production. Marian Saul even puts it into a simple formula in his book Marxism and the Question of the Asiatic Mode of Production 3. The key to Oriental systems is the absence of private property in land. All land equals the property of the head of state. The Asiatic villages, self-enclosed and self-sufficient, natural economy, form the basis of Asiatic systems plus public works of the central government, Sauer, 1977, 92. Under feudalism, peasants have in their possession all the conditions of production that allow for subsistence but remain anchored down to the land by feudal lords or knights. In Asiatic societies, Workers are not tied to the private landowners but instead are taxed directly by the state as the representative of communal ownership of property. The governmental structure of Asiatic societies never had more than three components, 1. Commerce, regulation of coinage in a planned way, 2. War, when it was needed, 3. Public works. Public works was the business of the central government. Reproducing commodities on a mass scale for endless consumption doesn't give expression to a way of life. Constructing buildings, monuments, and things based on sustenance creates tradition that can be explored through generational peregrination. The existence and essence of original being in high Gorion term resides in these societies. Since we are humans that are thrusted into the world, the former nomadic peoples of Asia found their being in the spatial temporal acceleration of civilizational building. Funny enough Heidegger accidentally helped the Soviet Union and other Eastern countries that had a communist revolution to awaken into a socialist modernity. So, Stalin was conservative in the sense that his search for bring was devoid of connections to European modernity. The highest national culture was developing both nationalist in form and socialist in content. The actualization process in the Soviet Union was accelerating before everyone's eyes, as Dimitrov put it. It's no secret as to why Marxism-Leninism rose primarily in the East.